Hi there, welcome to Only Baptist Church Online. Thank you so much for joining our online service this morning. We are in a crazy time right now, a time where we have a, just to have a ton of patience in a time that is uncertain. As a church, we have a lot of things to consider. Things like when are we going to meet back again and what is that going to look like? What should the church look like right now? How should we go about doing ministry at this time? What's too much, what's not enough? How best can we love our community right now? And if this season is going to change how we do church for the future as well. As scripture teaches us, we are to go to God in prayer in uncertain times, not necessarily looking for an answer, but looking for what our next step is. With this, the elders and deacons have asked Pastor Tubbs to change what him being uh, our lead pastor looks like for the next two weeks. We have asked Pastor Tubbs to go to the Lord on our church's behalf and to seek what our church's next step is and what that'll look like for this online season and for the, the rest of the year and uh, on beyond that. During this time, Pastor Tubbs will be in deep in God's word and deep in prayer every day for the next two weeks. We are excited and looking forward to what God has to say to Pastor Tubbs. Um, and we are amazingly confident that God will give Pastor Tubbs exactly what he needs to lead us through this time, through this year, um, and on beyond that. That does mean that I have the privilege of bringing the message this week and next week. We will be in Philippians chapter 1 today, and we'll be going through the book of Philippians for the month of May. Yes, did you know that we are in May? Because I didn't until yesterday. Um, I have gotten my days and even my months mixed up so many times during this, uh, during this time. So we will be in the book of Philippians uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays for the month of May. Philippians is often known as the book of joy. And while that is a theme in the book, there is something else um, that I feel like is more of the main message, more predominant in the book, and that is partnership for the gospel. Every chapter in Philippians is consumed by the gospel. Everything that is commanded for the sake of the gospel and partnering for the further the gospel and how the gospel continues to transform our lives uh, for those of us who are believers. So that is what we're going to focus on today, since that is what the first chapter is about and the entire book is about. That's what we'll focus on today. We are going to look at chapter 1, but we're going to focus mostly on verses 27 to 30. Before we go there, we're going to do an overview of verses 1 through 26 and, and see how they set up for, for the command Paul gives in verses 27 through 30. Go ahead and look at your Bibles and skim and follow along as we uh, do an overview of verses 1 through 26. Um, in the first 11 verses, Paul thanks God for the church and how the church has a very special place in Paul's heart. The letter that Paul writes the, to the Philippians is unique. It is the only letter where Paul does not have to write because of uh, certain issues that are going on in the church. Instead, this is a thank you letter that Paul has written to the Philippians. Paul has not just ministered to the Philippians, they have ministered to Paul in multiple ways, including uh, sending him finances on multiple times. Have you ever had someone in your life where you think of them and you're, you're thinking of them just because how awesome they are? You're thinking of them just because how amazing you are. And when you think of them, you think um, how much you would love to just sit with them and be with them, especially during this time. Um, when you think of them, they don't, they don't turn on you. They don't bring a lot of drama in your life. They don't drain you like others might. Instead, being with them just brings encouragement to you. It lifts you up, and when you talk to them or see them, often your day becomes better. They bring happiness to your life, and that is how Paul saw the Philippians. Then we see in verses twenty, uh, verses 12 through 18 that Paul speaks of his imprisonment, where he is, while he is writing this letter, is in prison. Paul talks of how there have been many in jail who have come to believe in Jesus, we see that God has changed literally one of the absolute worst situations and brought the absolute best outcome. Paul also speaks of a certain people who have been bad-mouthing him, uh, but it's clear that Paul could literally not care less 
for these people bad-mouthing him because those same people are also sharing the gospel and seeing people being saved for the gospel of Jesus. Paul says as long as they share the gospel and unbelievers are receiving the salvation for the first time, who cares what they say about me? May they continue to do so so others may be saved as well. Then in verses, <clears throat> then in verses 19 through 26, Paul speaks of his desire to bring God glory and honor in what he does uh, and who he is. Paul also is conflicted in this section. He knows that there's a chance that he could be put to death while he's in prison. And he knows that if he's put to death, that he would be with Christ, which is literally the best thing. But if he stays here on earth and he does not die, then he continues. He gets to continue to minister to the Philippians, um, which is better for the Philippians. So Paul summarizes his thoughts on this section well with very powerful words in verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Let's go on and read verses 27 through 30. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. And that's what we'll, we'll focus this, this morning. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that when I come and see you, or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in the Spirit with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For if it has been granted to you for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now here I still have. You are unable to read just about any word in Philippians chapter 1 and it not be tied to the gospel in some way. The Philippians have been partners in the gospel. Paul is in prison for the gospel. People in the prison have come to believe in the gospel. Paul has, encouraged, Paul has courage and confidence in the gospel. All of chapter 1 leads into the one command that Paul gives here in the end of the chapter, to live a life worthy of the gospel. If we're going to know what it means to live a life worthy of the gospel, then we need to understand two things. One, what is the gospel? And two, how do we live a life worthy of that? What does that mean? Um, so, first question is, what is the gospel? Paul mentions the gospel many times in chapter 1, and he will do many times for the rest of the book. So, what does Paul mean by the gospel. If we want to live a life worthy of it, then we kind of need to know what it is that we're looking at. The gospel is the most central and important part of Christianity. The gospel is the whole reason Christianity exists, and the gospel is the whole reason that our church exists. Let's pretend that I took a poll of 50 people who attended church regularly, and I asked them one question, and that question is, what is the gospel? If I asked 50 people what is the gospel that were regular church tenders, I would likely have 50 different answers, or at least many, many different answers. If you would like, have the people in your household write down your answer, each of your answers, and see if they are different and how different uh, they might be. So why is it that so many different believers in Christ would come up with so many different answers to the most central part of our faith. I think it's because we don't often see the gospel holistically. So what is the gospel? Uh, we are going to answer that in three ways. There's three different ways we're going to answer what is the gospel. First, the gospel is personal. The gospel is an invitation for every single person who has ever lived and every single person that will live. In a personal level, the gospel has five parts to it. First, Romans 3.23 tells us that every single one of us are sinners. Every single one of us have done something that goes against God himself. If uh, We have all fallen short of being able to go to heaven when we die. Two, Romans 6.23 tells us that because of that, we deserve hell after death. If we are not able to go to heaven, then we will go to hell after death for eternity in anguish and in pain and a foreverness of never being relieved 
of the punishment of our sin. Three, John 3.16 tells us and informs us that God sent his son, Jesus, into the world as completely man and completely God. Jesus lived a perfect sinless life. Jesus' goal was to take our punishment on of sin on himself. And four, Philippians 2, 6 through 8, continues and tells us that Jesus did this by allowing himself to be crucified on a, cro on a cross. On a cross, Jesus, being perfect, was the perfect sacrifice for our sin. He died and then overcame death itself as he rose from that death. So Jesus was sacrificed to take the punishment of our sin and then overcame sin by raising from life to death. And five, Mark 1.15 tells us, Now for us, if you want to be saved from your sin, all you need to do is believe in the story and repent of your sin. When I say repent, I mean two things. Repent means ask forgiveness of being a sinner, and from there, make it a commitment to battle your sin and your temptation. So if you trust in the story of Jesus and repent of your sin, you will be saved of your sin. And you will be saved for heaven and all that God promises in his word. And with that, the most amazing promise given to us is that Jesus is coming again. When he does, all things will be made right. So the personal aspect of the gospel is the story of Jesus on earth and an invitation to that story for everyone. Now, if we were, if I were talking to someone who was an unbeliever, who did not believe in Jesus, um, that is all I would share with them, is those five things. That's all I would share with them. But if we as believers want to see the gospel in its entirety, there is a second part um, that we need to be reminded of. And we'll call that the cosmic power of the gospel. Romans 5 tells us that when Adam sinned, sin entered into the world and all of creation. Romans 8, 20 through 22 tells us, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage, to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know what the whole creation has been groaning together in pains of childbirth up until now. The gospel impacts the whole universe. The gospel restores all things. The gospel is not a message that is simply there for just our benefit, but to show the glory of God. In that, he also restores the entirety of creation. The gospel is not just something that happens within us, but to show the authority and the supremacy of Christ. The third part of the gospel is that the gospel is a part of, if we are believers, the gospel is a part of our past, it is a part of our future, but it is also very much a part of our present. Titus 2 11 through 14 tells us, For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, past, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, present, awaiting for our blessed hope the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us for all lawlessness and to purify himself for a people of his own possession who are zealous for his good works. And that last couple of verses talks about the present or the future. If you're a believer, the gospel is not just something that has happened to you in salvation. It's, the gospel is not just something that we are able to look forward to when Jesus comes back. The gospel is to impact our lives currently as we live as believers. And that brings us to the question of how we can live a life worthy of the gospel. <clears throat> that is what Paul is talking about here. Currently living a life that is continually impacted and transformed by the gospel now. 
So how do we live a life worthy of the gospel? And we're going to read Philippians 1, 27 through 30 one more time. Philippians 1, 27 through 30. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come to you, come and see you or I'm absent, I am here of I hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engage in the same conflict that you saw I had, <clears throat> and now I still have. So what does it mean to live a life worthy of the gospel? In a sense, we understand what it means because we understand the gospel. If we live a life um, that has a gospel perspective, we understand that the gospel calls us to continually repent and fight our sin and temptation and to do away with anything in our lives that would, that would stop us from knowing Jesus more. The gospel forms how we see ourselves and it forms how we see others, how we see God, and it always leads us to bring glory to God. We had the opportunity to talk about this a little bit in our Connect group this past week. If you're not in a connect group at OBC right now, I want to tell you that this is the absolute perfect time to be plugged into a connect group. Please will please send me an email or Chris an email or go to the church website. But this is a perfect time to be a part of a connect group. And every single one of us need that right now. So the gospel calls us to bring glory to God. When we are about to act, we look at our options and we make a practice of choosing the option that brings glory to God. Someone does something to us, so we stop and we decide how we're going to react. And we look at our options, A, B, or C. And then we say, which one gives glory to God? Not which one do I want to do? Not which one do I think they deserve? But which one brings glory to God? Paul also describes what he's talking about here. Paul describes it as being unified in the gospel and for the gospel. I think another good way to say this is unity or partnership for the gospel, partnering for the sake of the gospel. The biggest ally in unity is sacrifice and selflessness. The biggest enemy to unity is pride. The gospel helps each of us see each other in a new light. Through the gospel, we come to a realization, something that is spelled out very well in Ephesians 2. This realization is that we all have one thing in common. We had to be saved. None of us could save ourselves. All of us struggle through life, and we all have found grace in God if we believe in God. Everyone fails. We are all in spiritual process, and none of us are all the way there. So while we struggle through this life, let's struggle together for the sake of the gospel. When someone messes up and hurts us, we have hurt feelings, and that's okay to have hurt feelings. That's very natural. But may we remember that as they're messing up, they're messing up just as we do. Our feelings matter, but may they not matter more than the gospel. That is also true for people who mess up um, that we don't like as much. It's much easier for us to give a little grace to those who we like more, but when it comes to those people who we don't like as much, it's a little bit more difficult. Um, so when it comes to those people, we don't have to be their best friends. We should probably keep our distance from them uh, at times. We don't have to make a lot of small talk with them, and we don't have to fake be nice to them. But we are always on their team for the sake of the gospel. Ephesians 4.2 says it well when it says bearing with each other in love. And as we continue in this knowledge of the gospel, our feelings will gravitate more towards partnership for the gospel and less on defending ourselves. Much like Paul is in verse 15 through 18. 
where Paul's feelings aren't hurt because there's people talking bad about him. His feelings, he's feeling joy because the gospel has been shared. As the gospel transforms us, it transforms our feelings as well. As the gospel transforms us, discipleship becomes a priority for our lives rather than just something that happens randomly or arbitrarily. Living a life worthy of the gospel does not mean that God is calling, it, calling you to clean up your act. Living a life of the gospel, worthy of the gospel does not mean that you need to do more good things. Living a life of the gospel does not mean that, you are, that, you, that God is calling you to do less of bad things. Living a life worthy of the gospel means submitting ourselves to Jesus and denying ourselves daily. Jesus said it best in Mark 8, 34. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. To live responding to the gospel means I deny myself and submit to what God wants to do through me as he transforms me by the gospel and for the gospel. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and we, we pray and we long and we yearn for the day that we can come back together as a church family. Let's pray.